Um, so here I'm going to go with <coughs> the rest of our lesson. We have some things to talk about in Hebrews 11, about a commendation by faith. And this time we're talking about Enoch. It starts over in Hebrews 11, which I'm trying to get open here. There we go. Where we find, you know, in that second verse, that people, as recorded in Scripture in time before, were commended by God because of their faith. It was in faith that they did what they did to receive God's commendation for what they were and what they were doing. The first example was Abel. The second example in Hebrews 11 is at verse 5, where we have this record of Enoch being commended that by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commanded as having pleased God. And the sixth verse continues that thought, right? Before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must first believe that he exists, and second, believe that he rewards those who seek him. Which is what Enoch did. He believed that God existed. He believed that God would reward those that sought him, those that, that made the effort. The effort was worthwhile, would have its payoff. And it did. Enoch, by faith, was taken up, did not see death, and was not found anymore, which is the record of Genesis 5.24. In fact, this is actually just a pretty straight quotation of that verse. But before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. So he received his commendation from God. I think it bears, you know, a little bit of explanation, what we're talking about here, um, which was, again, recorded in, in, uh, in Genesis 5. It said that Enoch walked with God at 524 of Genesis, and he was not, for God took him. <laughs> That's all there is about this, okay? When we say he was not, for God took him, meaning he, he, he could not be found, he was taken from earth. He didn't see death. It's like a handful of things in the New Testament that talk about this, that the way things work is this body, you know, our flesh is not going to heaven. We leave this body behind for a spiritual existence. And whatever that is, is not real clear or understood right now because it's spiritual in nature. That's what's recorded for us in 1 John 3. But whatever that is, is what we're going to be. Everybody has to undergo that transformation from this world to the spiritual one in some way. That's 1 Corinthians 15, right? But in 1 John 3, he said... Um, you know, in that second verse there, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we'll be like him, because we will see him as he is. So our current form is not what it's going to be. The spiritual state that he is in is the spiritual state we will be in, and whatever that is is what we we're going to, to understand at that time, but we don't know yet, and that's all right. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. So that's a, a certain transformation from this life to the next. And over at 1 Corinthians 15, 
uh, is where uh, Paul writes about this coming resurrection. Starting in verse 50, I tell you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you, a mystery will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, we will be changed. This perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And this corroborates what he said um, to the Thessalonians, you know, that those who have fallen asleep in Christ will be raised from the dead, imperishable, and we will join them in the clouds in the air with the Lord and forevermore be in that way. It's some kind of transformation, as he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, something happens. And there's this, you know, translation, this idea that you're taken up. A change has happened. That's what happened for Enoch. But the rest of the account there in Genesis 5, for Enoch, you know, well, we could start at 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So he got to age 65 before fathering Methuselah, and from that time, he walked with God. 300 years, it says. That's a long time to be in the ancient world that was such that God was going to destroy it by flood for the wickedness that was in it. It's a long time to live right. And he did that. <laughs> he walked with God 300 years. Now that man had faith. This is his commendation. It's testified uh, at 22 that he that uh, that he lived a, a walked with God 300 years, and it's testified at 24 he walked with God. Putting those things together, that the reason for which he did not see death was that he was commended by God. He pleased God with his life. Now, here's where it gets even more interesting in, in my way of thinking anyway. This, you know, Hebrews says that he uh, received that testimony, that he had pleased God. And in the place where the Hebrew text reads that he walked with God, the uh, Greek translation reads that he pleased God, which is very reasonable reading. But this word in the Hebrew is just a fairly common word for walking or for going. It's saying that Enoch went with God. When we say he walked with God, we wonder perhaps about, you know, the walk of life, the choices that we make. And that's true, but I think it's actually even more simple than that. Uh, it's saying he, he went with God. He was on God's side the way Abel was. So he pleased God by being with God. He stuck to the Lord. He stayed with God's things. And those are the, that's the meaning there at Genesis 5, 22 and 24 when it says he walked with God, he went with them. But I found that this same thing is said about Noah in Genesis 6, at verse 9. Even at verse 8, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. He was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. This is the same as what was said about Enoch. He went with God. 
He made his choice. His choice was God. That's how he lived. That's how he walked. And it makes sense. You see a pretty big difference. You know, if you're looking at these opening chapters of Genesis and you're looking for somebody who did right and was called out for doing right, you've got Abel, you've got Enoch, you've got Noah. That's what's happening. And these went with God. They didn't go with the crowd. But what I found very interesting was that seventh chapter that in the 18th verse, the Hebrew says that the ark went in the same way that Enoch went and Noah went. Uh, my translation says the ark floated on the face of the waters. And if you're interested in seeing criticisms of modern translations on this point, uh, Robert Alter has some pretty sharp ones. Uh, and he goes with went because everybody knows what it means. <laughs> the ark went on the face of the waters. What's wrong with that? That makes perfect sense to everybody. Uh, it's true. Enoch went with God. Noah went with God. The ark went on the face of the waters. That's fine. But what's interesting about that is the implications of using the same word in these cases. Well, when, where? Where are we going? When Enoch walked with God, the result was he was taken, as Hebrews 11.5 records, so that he didn't see death. When Noah went with God, Genesis 6.9, or walked with God, Genesis 6.9, he was saved from among his generation. They died in the flood. He did not. He survived. He lived. And his family, who joined him in the ark, went upon the face of the waters, escaping death. Where are we going? We are escaping death. We're going with God to life. That's the meaning of this. To walk with God is to escape death. It's to live a true life, to have eternal life. But if we go even deeper on this, on this point, with the ark going on the face of the waters... Don't you remember another place here in Genesis that talks about the face of the waters? <laughs> yes, yes indeed. It's, it's the first chapter, right? Genesis chapter 1, the creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. The darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. The ark went on the face of the waters. The Spirit of God went on the face of the waters. In the creation, this moment is you know, very much a pregnant moment in which we know something's about to happen. It's formless and void. There's the water and the breath of God or the Spirit of God is there on the surface. What is that? It's going to be something, isn't it? It's going to be, God said, let there be light. And there was. It's going to be the creation. He's going to call things into existence. The earth is going to appear coming up from the waters, the dry land. Why did Noah build an ark? Because God told him to do that? 
told him about something he had never seen before, that nobody had ever seen before, but Noah believed him, and so he built it. It's what was written in 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter 3, at verse 20, it said that God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which, that is to say, in which ark, a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. That's 1 Peter 3.20. That in the flood of Noah, there are eight persons in the ark, and they are brought safely through water. When we read that the ark went on the surface of the waters, and we read before that Noah went with God, and Enoch went with God, and both of them and the occupants of the ark, by doing so, evaded death. They lived. 1 Peter 3.20 says that time when they were in the ark, they were brought safely through water, And the 21st verse says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, as water can do. If you get dunked in water, that's like a bath, right? It's not a bath. But as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. (coughs) Its power is resurrection, Jesus escaping death, being, uh, you know, he couldn't be held by death. It was impossible. He, he escaped death, and we also are putting our old selves to death to be resurrected in him, a new self, a new creation in Christ Jesus. In the same way that they in the ark went with God and were brought safely through the water, we in baptism go with God and are brought safely through the water. That's what he's saying. (coughs) Over in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul describes the church as the bride of Christ, the, the wife, and says, in the 25th and 26th verses, that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. The washing of water with the word just fits like a glove on what we're talking about. When the Spirit of God hovered above the waters, and immediately God said, and you put it together, for example, with the Gospel of John in the first chapter, that everything was created through the Word. Apart from the Word was nothing created that was created. Here in Ephesians 5, 25 and 26, the church is cleansed by the washing of water with the Word which is very similar to what 1 Peter 3.21 said, not the removal of filth from the flesh, but the appeal to God for a clean conscience. That the word, if you will, that the, the utterance of the Spirit of God, in some sense, is what's hovering, if you will, or what's in the air when you are baptized. You're doing what God said. And this thing that comes forth from the water, you, when you are coming up from baptism, are a new creation created by the Word, the commandment of God. Hebrews 10.22 talks about the same thing, that we draw near to Him um, it's not like, you know, the former covenant. We draw near. Our hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Our bodies washed with pure water. It's everywhere in the New Testament. It's, it's no secret that God expects this of us. The 
but you're seeing that this is the means of commendation. It's how what God wants to exist, what God wants uh, to bring out about, it's how he does it. By his word, which is powered by his breath, the spirit of God. James talks about it this way, and I think is one of the clearer passages, but he said in chapter 1 of James, in the 18th verse, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his created, his creatures, his creations. We are brought forth by the word of truth. We are the first fruits of the created, the first of his creatures. When we are brought forth by his word. When James speaks of it this way, he's making us a creation. And that creation, just like the one recorded in Genesis, is by means of his word which is impelled by his spirit. When you are baptized in the name of Christ, you're following the instructions that are breathed by God into the Bible. It's not something that we made up. It's not our tradition. and We didn't give it its meaning or its purpose. God did this in his word. When you do that, you're doing the most spiritual thing you could possibly do. And Ephesians 2 talks about us as a creation in Christ Jesus. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to walk in. So we're a new, <clears throat> we're a new creation when we obey the gospel. A Christian is a new creation, a new creature, but a new creation brought forth by the Word in the same way that this world was created by the Word, which, by the way, is not out of context. We're not going crazy here. Remember Hebrews 11, before we got to Abel, in verse 3, by faith we understand the worlds were created by the Word of God. It all fits together in the eye of the, the Hebrew letter. As looking at this through the lens of Hebrews 11, these all fit together. Yeah, we're created in Him for good works. And if you keep going in Ephesians, down to the fourth chapter, when he speaks about the way that we have learned Christ and the way that we have been taught in Him, beginning at verse 20. And now we put off, verse 22, the old self, which belongs to the former manner of life, and be renewed, verse 23, in the spirit of the mind to put on the new self, verse 24, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And when we are becoming Christians, we are putting away the old self, the old manner of life, the old corruption of this world. We're renewed in the spirit, in the mind. We're a new self, as he says, created after the likeness of God, which also is the Genesis account of creation. He made humanity in his own image. And the letter to the Colossians runs parallel to the letter to the, the Ephesians. Over in Colossians 3, it's 5 through 10, where he says very similar things to what you read in Ephesians 4. Put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from the mouth. 
Do not lie to one another, seeing you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We're called to this kind of a life, not just to the start in baptism, but to this kind of a life, these good works that he created for us to walk in, that it should be our life from now on. Enoch walked with God 300 years. <laughs> God was patient, 1 Peter 3.20, during the construction of the ark. That's 100 years during which Noah was a preacher of righteousness. We're created in His image to live for Him, perhaps to die for Him. But Enoch was commended as righteous, God commending him so that he didn't see death. He escaped death because he lived right. And I would turn you to 3 John in closing. Because when we talk about this commendation, when we talk about this testimony, God is the one who testifies for us. We're not looking necessarily for the testimony of man. Maybe sometimes we do mark one another, those who walk rightly, who set a good example before us. That's true. But ultimately, you know, the commendation that we're looking for, the testimony that we're looking for is the testimony of God. And when John writes his third letter, He says these things to the beloved Gaius, whom he loves in truth. First thing that he says of interest to us is found in the third and fourth verses of 3 John. He said, I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, which, by which he means there were some brothers who were gospel preachers who had been sent from where John was, uh, or I'm sorry, from where Gaius was, and they met up with John and told him how they had been sent and how the church there, where Gaius is, is doing right. So John said, I rejoice greatly when these brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And Paul talked about his child in the faith, Timothy, not that they're literally descended, but that he taught him the gospel. So John taught Gaius the gospel, and he's very glad to see that, John, that Gaius in his maturity is sending faithful gospel preachers. They're supporting these men who are teachers. And he said, I rejoiced greatly. I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in the truth. But you see, they testified about his truth, the apostle said, you are walking in truth. And there's that walk again, like Enoch walked with God and Noah walked with God and the ark walked on the water. <laughs> I still think that's incredible. <laughs> but the second place in 3 John where it is of interest to us is that 12th verse where he speaks about one who is serving among them there wherever Gaius is. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And that's the place where we leave it today because that's what you're looking for. It's good to have the testimony from those who are faithful. And it's good when we are doing what is right and, and we're setting a good example and others can point to that and say, here's, here's somebody who is doing right. And Hebrews said, consider their faith, consider the outcome of their lives. That is all good and right, but what you really want is 3 John 12. Demetrius received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. The truth can testify about our lives if we are living in truth, if we are walking according to the
the Scriptures, if we have book, chapter, and verse for what we say and do. And that truth, of course, is the Word of God, and that Word of God is spoken by the Son of God, impelled by the Spirit of God, intended and commanded by the Father. So where today, if I may ask, where is your testimony from? What testifies about you and your life? Is it ordered by the Scripture? Have you sought God according to what's recorded for us in the Bible? Have you put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins? Have you decided, I'm going to give my life to Him? I'm going to walk with God from now on for however long it is. Enoch did it 300 years, I can't imagine. And I don't need to, I'm not going to make it to 300 <laughs> I'm probably not going to make it to 100. I'm surprised I got as far as I've gotten. Let's just be honest. <laughs> I'm surprised that I got here. I never thought I would see this. <laughs> but whatever it is, from now on, give, our, give your life to God that I will serve him from here forward. I've spent enough time in the flesh doing what I wanted and what the world wanted. It's time to live for God from now on. Today, are you a Christian? Have you done these things? Well, become a Christian if you haven't done so. We have water prepared that you might be baptized in his name for forgiveness. Christian friend, have you been walking as you're called? Have you been walking in this way, stalwart in the faith, looking to those who did right before us? Well, repent if not. Put God first again. Let us pray with you and for you to be restored to him and to have resolve to keep going. Remember the major theme of Hebrews 11 is keep going. Keep going. If you need today the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, please let nothing stop you from obeying God and obeying the gospel. Let your need in the Spirit be known now by coming to the front while we stand and while we sing.